So a flurry of transactions hit the wire on Monday, which included signings, potential signings, roster designations, and unfortunately, one gutting season-ending injury update to actually a recent guest we had on the vault. Yeah, and Bobby, the news doesn't stop there because there's a story out there about how the Ravens lured in Odell Beckham Jr. to come and sign with the Ravens, and it revealed what owner Steve Bashotti and several front office executives did and some uncharacteristic moves to get the deal done. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside my co-host Sarah Ellison. It is Tuesday, July 25th. And this is your morning Ravens update from Inside the Vault. Zay Flowers talked about in a recent podcast interview about how Todd Munkin is giving him freedom, which seems to be the theme of the new offensive coordinator. He's giving him freedom and his route running that he didn't have in college that could help him get even more separation. And also from that interview, we're going to talk about what's the difference between a diva and a dog wide receiver that up ahead. Oh, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Plus, it's the Bengals' turn to go through quarterback contract drama. And their owner, Mike Brown, talked Monday about his team's cap situation. All right, we have all of that and more coming up. It's a jam-packed episode. Thank you for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news and our opinions in about 30 minutes. All right, Bobby, let's just dive right in. There's no time to waste. We'll first go through all the transactions that happened on Monday. First and foremost, the beloved Marcus Peters. We knew this was coming. Reports were suggesting it. He did indeed agree to a one-year deal with the Las Vegas Raiders. That is according to NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. Lamar Jackson had a very similar reaction to what I had. Lamar congratulated Marcus on Instagram, but in that, you know, little congratulatory message, he had a teary eyed emoji, Bobby. Yeah, he did. And I'm sure a good portion of the fan base has that same kind of sentiment right now. Um, I I found myself today once it actually went final. And again, we're taping this the night of Monday, the 24th, you know, I found myself taking a walk down memory lane and going back to the 2019 season where in year EDC acquired Marcus from the Rams, right? For a fifth round pick and linebacker, Kenny young. And while it was a tumultuous, you know, few years, and unfortunately, you know, the entire 2021 season was, he was sidelined with that ACL injury. I think he will be remembered for the most part uh, for what he did that year for what he did during the 2020 season uh, for his impact in the locker room. The guy's a fiery competitor, an absolute ball hawk, and and he absolutely will be missed. And unfortunately, you're left wondering, what if? What if he hadn't gone down, you know, before the 2021 season on that non-contact play in training camp? Back-to-back plays, you might remember, with Gus Edwards before that just injury plague season. So obviously wish the best for Juice Man. That things run its course with Harbaugh in terms of some of their blowouts. Who knows? I'm sure there's still a ton of love between the two sides and best wishes to him in Vegas. Yeah, I think he's going to go down as one of Eric DaCosta's best acquisitions, especially trade wise. That's right up there with Roquan Smith. So I'm sad. Everybody knew how much I wanted him back, but I'm the type of person that always looks forward. So we're moving forward. The Ravens are nearing an agreement. This is according again to the NFL Network. This is Cameron Wolf's reporting. Um, They're nearing an agreement with, and you're going to have to check me on the pronunciation on this, with cornerback Arthur Mullet. Do I got that right? (laughs) That's what I found out there. That's what I found. You go ahead. Don't let this girl get hot. Don't let her get hot. (laughs) So he is a um, former cornerback for the Steelers the last two years. He plays in the slot. He, and he's he's got a lot of special team snaps. So, Bobby, sometimes I find the best way to cut through just the heart of how good players are is to ask their former fans. Like sometimes you can go to other journalists or podcasters, but they'll give these like long winded answers. I'll say this. I read a lot of Steelers fans comments. Most of them were like, well, good luck. They liked him. They did like him. They said he's a dog when it comes to run defense, but a liability and coverage. So uh, we'll see. It has not been an official signing yet, but if they do, I think he'll just be in the mix with many other guys to fill that slot cornerback position and maybe provide some depth. 
And let's remember too, at this point, you know, they have their starters in Marlon Humphrey and and projected, you know, Rocky Sin, who's gonna replace Marcus. So what they're really looking for is is depth on the outside, potentially here in the slot as well, like we said. Also some some special team snaps. And, you know, let's see what happens in training camp. We know after Marlon and Rock, there's some uncertainty as we've already covered. So uh probably nothing more, nothing less than that. But, you know, let's we'll see. We'll see if he ends up being signed and just Shifting gears here a little bit to some key injury updates that we wanted to cover before we dive into really the meat of the show and a great interview that was recently conducted by The Athletic with Odell Beckham Jr. Got to talk about a recent guest, and this is unfortunate news for Ravens long snapper Nick Moore, who, according to Jeff Zarebeck, recently tore his Achilles while training in preparation for the season. So as the Ravens tend to do, they always have contingency pl- plans in place. They've already held a long snapper tryout, and it was won by former Seattle Seahawk, who just so happened to be a, a former Pro Bowl selection at the long snapper position back in 2020, Tyler Ott. And, and that was first reported by Aaron Wilson. So, uh, you know, I, I just exchanged some texts back and forth with Nick, like probably some – had already have already listened to our episode with him that we released earlier this month when we were on vacation. Nick is an awesome dude. And it just, it pains me uh, when, when player seasons are taken away from them at this really any time, but this time they're so close to starting their, you know, their next chapter and a new season and a clean slate. And then all of a sudden in one breath gone, just like that. Just like that. Really, really heartbreaking, especially as you said, he's such a great guy. Nick Moore is even when he got the job, he just gave credit to everybody else. Um, so we wish him the best. I hope he can get back in the game after this. Like sometimes injuries, the NFL just keeps going and, and leaves you behind. I hope that is not the case for Nick. I know he made a transition from other other positions. So we wish him well. Hopefully he gets back, gets that Achilles back to 100 percent. And we want to see him out on the field. More injury news. So this was not completely unexpected. Uh, The Ravens did indeed put wide receiver Rashad Bateman on the PUP list to start camp. Jeff Zrebeck again reported this. He also says, obviously not surprising. He said the Ravens figured to ramp up Bateman slowly this summer as he returns from a Liz Frank foot injury slash surgery. Bobby, in our episode Monday morning, we had talked about that the Ravens had taken him off the did not report list. And then they said they acted, they did him off of that. That threw me off. I was like, oh, are, are they? I thought they, he would go straight from that when he reported to the PUP list. But because they first just said he was activated off of it, I was like, oh, maybe he's not going to start on PUP. I was surprised by that. This news is less surprising. To me, Liz Frank, we've talked about it on the show several times. Liz Frank, one of the worst injuries, worse than Achilles sometimes, worse than the ACL. I mean, one of the worst. I think the Ravens should absolutely play it safe with Rashad Bateman. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So let's give him the time. We know what he can become, but he can only become that if he is healthy. So that's what's going on there. Any reaction from you in in addition to that? Yeah, I would just say let's all have some grace and patience with Rashad like we did with Ronnie because he he deserves that. And like you said, I think you said it best. You know, it's, it's a grueling 17 game, 18 week season, six months out of the year. They need him when it counts down mm-hmm. the stretch, not during training camp, period. Exactly. And then so with him going on, there is actually somebody that came off defensive tackle Rashad Nichols. He passed his physical. So he is now activated off the PUP list. And so that just keeps it as what we said yesterday. We got J.K. Dobbins, Patrick Ricard, and now Bateman and then wide receiver Mike Thomas and then cornerback Pepe Williams. I keep hearing from different reporters around that they feel like uh, Pepe could get the green light sometime, sometime soon. Jonas Schaefer is the latest person to tweet that. So that could be exciting because, again, he will be in that slot cornerback uh, competition. All right, let's switch gears. We needed to run through all those transactions on the eve of report day, which, um, yeah, it's official. It's crazy. Two, well, I say on the eve of report day, that's because we're recording Monday night. Report day is today for those that are listening. It is today, <laughs> Tuesday. They are reporting so, and they're going to have a couple um, podium interviews, things like that, um, later today. 
So there was a story that was published from The Athletic Monday afternoon that, Bobby, I really enjoyed reading. Okay. And it was from Dan Pompey and Jeff Zrebeck. He retweeted it several times. Obviously, it's his coworker, um, but it also was just a very good story. So just to preface this, we've hit on elements of this story um, through different episodes as they kind of came out, kind of trickled out. And so some of this isn't quite news, but nobody's really put it together in quite a way that kind of totally paints a picture. So I wanted to read some excerpts from it. I mean, go check it out if you have an athletic uh, subscription. If you don't, you should. I mean, I do it for Jeff alone, but then sometimes you get, you know, golden nuggets like this story. So there's a lot in there. Jeff alone, it's worth it for the season. Yes, no doubt. absolutely. And they always have like certain specials that make it, you know, affordable, especially when you first start up. But what I wanted to focus on in this story, and there's a lot, it, it talks about how when OBJ first got injured during that Super Bowl, it went through like what he struggled with. He almost wanted to retire. He didn't know if he had it in him to kind of go through this again. So the first half of the story is a little bit about that. So then once he like figures out that he wants to come back, he's getting his knee back, he's getting his spirit, his love of the game back. So then it becomes, okay, I'm coming back, but where is my new home going to be? And so it explains how the Chiefs, the Cowboys, the Giants, the Bills, the Jets, and the Ravens all throughout his free agency process at some point reached out. And from the Ravens, it was John Harbaugh who made the initial personal pitch to OBJ and OBJ admits in the story that he was at first against being a Baltimore Raven, like just against it. And here's the quote. He says, if I'm being honest, I was resistant. There are, there were other places I wanted to go. I wasn't necessarily a Ravens fan because the Ravens always whipped my bleep, you know, always whipped my bleep. You know what? Okay. And I look back, there are a couple of times that OBJ for sure got the Ravens, but I I remember part of it was due to injury. And when the Ravens were healthy, the Ravens were able to like slow him down for sure. So there might be other reasons he may not be stating here that he didn't want to become a Raven. Mostly Bobby, I would think that most wide receivers haven't want to come, haven't wanted to come to the Ravens in quite some time. It's not necessarily known for this bastion of wide receiver wealth, right? So he doesn't say that. I'm adding that. That's me. So I really want to get into how the Ravens teamed up, which again, this is the part where we've gotten trickled stories, but it's all kind of put together here. And the most uncharacteristic part is how Steve Bashotti comes in. So I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs for how the Ravens went on this complete blitz for him. So this is what Dan Pompey wrote. So he goes, during the NFL owners meetings, Beckham created a stir by showing up in the lobby of the Arizona Biltmore Hotel. The Ravens seized the opportunity and met with him in a conference room. For about an hour, Eric DaCosta and, get this, Executive Vice President Ozzie Newsom. So people who think that Ozzy <laughs> isn't involved anymore, you would be dead wrong. So Ozzy's in this meeting and Harbaugh sat down with Beckham, but they did not talk much about football or his knee. They spoke of his hopes and dreams and being a father. Why? Here's, here's the why. Here's Dan saying, remembering that Beckham signed with the Rams instead of the Chiefs, 49ers, Packers or Patriots in 2021 because he said the Rams made him feel wanted. So Ravens owner Steve Bashotti made the unusual decision to involve himself, calling Beckham multiple times. Then quarterback Lamar Jackson, who was trying to get a new contract of his own at the time, He also spoke with Beckham about teaming up. So that's a close quote. So that's the Raven side, Bobby. So let's stop right there to get your reaction on that. I mean, it's Harbaugh. It's Eric DaCosta. It's Ozzy. It's Steve Bashotti. And it's Lamar Jackson, who doesn't even have a contract himself, who are all going after him. And so to me, it's just like, man, when the Ravens know they want something, 
they go for it. And this was a team effort for sure on their part. Without question. And I think we're probably both in agreement that, you know, the two top areas of the list that were check boxes were feeling loved monetarily speaking with 15 million guaranteed, 3 million in incentives that could get him to 18 and also the chance of, of pairing up with Lamar. But my goodness, coming in a close third is all of this. Yeah. The way that, to, to your point, they blitzed. This was an all in effort organization wide, you know, having a Hall of Famer in Ozzy, having the lo- third longest tenured head coach in the NFL in Harbs having the guy who's ultimately going to make or be a, you know, a huge part of the decision in Eric DaCosta and be a part of that, that negotiation process. And then, of course, the man who's calling the shots, the CEO, Steve Bashotti. So, man, I remember when Odell just showed up to that Biltmore Hotel, right, for the owners' meetings. And what's crazy about it is that that wasn't even the biggest storyline. What was the biggest storyline from that? Yeah, Lamar that was more. Listen, yeah. the organization. You know, so it's just crazy how much actual activity was going on there. You'd have to think that the, or, the the organizational brass, that their heads must have been spinning. Lamar releases the tweet as Harb sits down. OBJ shows up. They get him in a hotel room conference center and, and, and try to, you know, begin this process or take it to the next step. So, yeah, I thought it was an awesome read. And, and like I said, I think that the monetary side of things and the opportunity to partner up with Lamar were absolutely – you know, the biggest impact kind of bullet points, but man, this is some pretty important context too. Well, and he, and he said a million times, he's like, they made me feel wanted. And then the Ravens were smart enough to take note that that's what he said about the Rams too. And so absolutely you can't discount it. So here's what's funny. So that's the Ravens part of it. So then, so then Odell explains to Dan Pompey how he ultimately, because remember he was resistant to it. So it goes into like this long story about how one time Odell Beckham went to Jerusalem. By the way, that is definitely on my bucket list. And he said he just wanted to like, you know, learn about, you know, Jesus and and all of those types of things. And 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 I, like so he's a, what I'm trying to get at is like he's a man of faith. And that's what the story is trying to set up is that he's this man of faith. So the reason why I'm I'm digging into this, because I Bobby frequently love to take life lessons from football because again, these guys sacrifice so much and work so hard for where they're going. And so like, I felt like this was like good advice, even though Beckham wasn't giving advice, he just explained how he came to his decision. But to me, it was like good advice on how to make decisions. Um, And I've often done it similarly. So, so he's resistant to it. And then I'm going to quote Dan Pompey again. He says he prayed about it. And he prayed about where that's how he made his decision. Then Odell says, it's that voice you hear in your head, the feel in your gut, kind of an intuition. Really, that's God's voice. He says, I started hearing God louder than my resistance. So it's like, I do the same thing that sometimes I just try to shut out all the noise and I just try to listen to my own thoughts and my own intuition and my goals and all that kind of stuff. So he, he shuts it all out. There's other quotes I don't get to, but he says he's not worried about what other people are thinking and what he needs to prove all that. He shuts all that out. And then he's trying to like, just center himself and listen. And so he's saying, I started to hear God louder than my resistance. That's God protecting you. The signs were showing me this is the right path. Then he says, The voice, which is really just his own voice, right? The voice reminded him the Ravens were a contender, reminded him of that, and reminded him that it's a premier organization. It made him dream about what he and Jackson could accomplish together. The voice told him to think about how he clicked with Harbaugh. I bring that out because there's so many people that criticize Harbaugh and sometimes he needs a lot, you know, he deserves criticism. But in this, I think it's underrated his relationships with players sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, So the voice told him to think about how he clicked with Harbaugh. And and how he went about doing this, right? Personally picking up the phone and calling him pre-Arizona. Exactly, Bobby. Absolutely, exactly. So that's work on Harbaugh's part, right? And then and then he's being reminded of it as he's trying to like think through it all. Then it reminded him, he said, 
about how he enjoyed playing for Munkin. So now bring in another guy that's almost like helpful in bring him, bring him, him, him in. And so then it said a one year contract wasn't what Odell was looking for, but probably what he needed. And this last quote is from Beckham himself. He goes, I'm thinking like this is my last year. I'm going to give it my all this year. And then if something happens after that, we can go from there. Close quote. That last one was like, well, do you think that you can keep going after this or whatever? But his mindset is like, listen, I'm just giving my all this year. And in my mindset, it's like, because you never know, right? Like, you never know if it's going to be taken away. Nick Moore. Look what just happened with Nick Moore. It's what Beckham's been through several times with injury. So that's all he's doing. He's like, I'm going to give everything this year as if it's my last. And then I can think about next year, next year. So anyway, I I just love the whole story. I thought it was really cool. Like just how to be proactive from an organizational side and then how to like clear out all the noise on a personal side and think things through. And sometimes when you do that, if you just like think things through, push out the noise, you can see things more clearly. And that's kind of what happened for him is he could envision himself in Baltimore. And again, like we said, the money doesn't hurt, but but I feel like sometimes people discount this side of it too. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, we did our best to summarize it. Like we, we didn't get everything. So mm-hmm. again, you know, go, go consider checking this out, get, get a potential, you know, seasonal mem- membership. I know a lot of folks probably aren't thrilled with some of the athletics business decisions that they've made and layoffs in, in recent weeks. But for Jeff, like we keep saying, Jeff is our guy. You know, we, we had a great time catching up with him earlier this month in an episode and, um, I think it's it's worth that alone for sure. And it's it's a relatively economical uh, investment as well for the season. So let's shift gears to a recent interview conducted by the Lounge Podcast, Ravens Productions. They had on rookie first rounder Zay Flowers, who obviously has garnered enough attention in recent weeks, but why not? We'll continue to chat about him, right? Why not? And we Wanted to give you a couple takeaways from the conversation. Again, the the full interview can be found on the lounge across their platforms. I love this that you snipped here. Zay explaining dog versus diva. Yeah. Receiver and DB's got to have confidence because you if, you, if you don't, then you, you just be out there. Right, exactly. And I, got, exactly. And I like you got to have a little diva about you. No, dog. Okay, dog. dog. That's a better D word. <laughs> yeah, oh, dog. I, I like that. And like, but you got to have that confidence because like you'll just it, it won't work. Yeah, because if you if you don't have the confidence, now you're gonna go out there thinking too much. And you're gonna be like, all right, am I doing this right? But you just go out there and say, yo, I'm gonna do this. It don't really matter how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna get it done. Sarah, there's no room for divas <laughs> on this team. There's too many mouths to feed. There's too much talent spread around all the, you know, the playmaking positions. So I, I love that dog versus diva. He was short. He was quick. It's almost he, like was, he was quick ready for that. I'm not a diva. I'm a dog. Well, it's funny because I've used the diva, the word diva a lot, and I've like. Uh, like a diva wide receiver. And I've said in the past, like, but you need a little diva. And now that I've thought more of it and he, that he's adding like, no, be a dog. I 1000% agree. Now this doesn't mean I'm not going to use the word diva sometimes. Cause sometimes they are. And maybe I'm like, really d- reading into this too much but it's because we're in the business of describing players right and we have to be able to differentiate and i'm sure the scouts do this too they got and coaches have to do this you got to be able to like read people and all that kind of stuff so i i i kind of like this quote and maybe i went a little bit too deep because when you think about a diva you think of somebody that's like self-important which is very different from confident and is temperamental which i also think is a little bit different from emotional because football is an emotional game but temperamental OK, whereas like a dog. Now, this one, I was like struggling coming up with with wording for it. So, of course, I go to Urban Dictionary. So because dog can be like your friend, your homie, whatever. But like in this context of football, they have the best definition. It's tenacious. Stop it. Nothing. Hustler doing whatever is necessary. OK, yes. Yes. I think that is a much better description for uh zay flowers he's a dog okay so like to me flowers is in kind of like the roquan dog kind of category all right so you're 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 just like you don't have to be loud a dog a dog can be loud because ray lewis was was loud but you don't have to be loud but you are just the confidence just oozes off of you right 
Okay. Now, somebody who just doesn't have confidence and this, I, Bobby, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember, and I don't want to pile up on him. I'm just using it as like an example. I remember when Brashad Perriman was drafted. Garrett had come down with him from, because Garrett always went to uh, to the drafts. He'd be on on site covering it. And he'd oftentimes, you know, I think in that one, like he rode back on a train with Perriman to come back to the facility. So, you know, I went in, he, Perriman was sitting in Garrett and, and Ryan's office and I walk in to introduce myself. And and Bobby, I am telling you, within seconds, I was taken aback by Brashad Perriman because I was just like, he is like, not just shy, but it was like an awkward shy. Like he couldn't even like, he just felt so uncomfortable by saying hi, you know, like saying hello and having like a, a conversation. And I was like, holy moly, he must be uber talented because this uh, like I've met players that don't want to really talk. That's fine. Most guys don't. Everybody's always talking to you and whatever. And I've met shy guys, but it was just awkward. He was just like, he he didn't have any confidence to hold like a conversation. Now, some guys like that can still succeed, right? Because they have a switch, but I never saw the switch for Perriman. I never saw it come on. Okay. So he's like not confident. Zay, Roquan, dogs. Diva, I'm going to give this Dobbins is a little bit dog for sure, but he's also a little bit diva. <laughs> and like, oh, yeah, for I, sure. I'm not saying that just because he wants the ball because dogs want the ball. And I'm not saying that because he wants to get paid because dogs also want to get paid. But like, for example, when even Lamar Jackson was trying to get his money and to your point, when he kind of like put out that tweet that he asked for a trade and oh, by the way, he had already talked to Odell to bring him in, you know, that wasn't like a temperamental, emotional tweet from Lamar. That was calculated. He was like, tenacious, stop at nothing, do whatever's necessary to get my money, right? But it wasn't temperamental. Whereas when Dobbins did it, it felt a little bit more emotional rather than, you know, calculated and, and all that kind of stuff. And so like... I, I would I, I definitely think there's some dog and Dobbins. I'm not taking it all away, but I also think he's got a little diva. And so I just that's why I love so much that Zay Flowers like differentiated because for the first time to me, I'm like, perfect. Now I've got now I've got words to differentiate much better what I've been trying to say in the past. Write that down. File it away. We're definitely going to be revisiting <laughs> at that at some point this season, especially watching Zay's you know rookie season unfold and. You know, speaking of that, he talked a little bit about the differences between what he was doing at BC and now under Todd Munkin from a route running and technique standpoint. In college, our routes had to be ran a certain way to the light because we ran like revolutions. Revolutions like one, like you take a step, then the outside step count is one. Then you mm. take another one, two, and it match up perfect with the quarterback. So mm. like at the top of the route, you couldn't really do moves to mm. get open. So mm-hmm. you just had to speed it in or break it in or just take it deep. Now I could just I can make a move at the top of the route and Lamar still be on time. Right. I can make a move at the line, run, make another move and get open. Interesting. So is it that's I feel like that's what make it easier for me because I'm able to get a deep a defender off me. And and Sarah, you know, a, a couple takeaways that I had as well was, you know, he wants to he thinks that he can and wants to play every single position within you know, what's expected of, of wide receivers, all mm. three positions. And he, what I was reminded of during his time at Boston College, and it's easy to get lost in in some of the, I don't know, things were, were maybe he was labeled as coming out of BC as the slot guy. He played 75% of his snaps at Boston College on the outside. So it sure seems like to me, one, he's capable of being more than just a slot guy. and the word that we keep coming back to under Todd Munkin. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of freedom within his route running based on what he's told us and what we've learned from, you know, through the early going here with Todd's scheme. Yeah, that quote kind of blew my mind a little bit because he's been able to get so much separation that you know he's doing that with his like, we, we talked about it. He had like, he was like in the 96th percentile of being able to, of, of like shiftiness and creating separation and like that, that overall athleticism. 
to know that he wasn't able to like set people up the way you you might want to when you when you have your breaks and all that kind of stuff. So I'm interested to see if he's going to be able to get even more separation. Now, again, that was in college, Boston College, or maybe it just won't be so hard to transition as a rookie. Like, oh, these moves aren't working. Like he wasn't able to to move to, to use them as he could read the defender and kind of set them up. And he also talked about, by the way, he's the one who initiated those workouts with Lamar and OBJ. And he said he wanted to do it because he was he wants to get a better feel for Lamar's throws. And he also talked about how OBJ gave him advice on when to break on different routes and all that kind of stuff. So I think like a combination of of having OBJ there as a teacher and having that freedom, that should be pretty good for him and hopefully that means that he can transition quickly as a rookie now, i just want to quickly we got to we kind of move through things much quicker here so we got to wrap up i just wanted to follow up on some comments i made yesterday on we had a back and forth about why people i, I said make it make sense why would people think that by the ravens putting jk dobbins on pub pup that that means that he's holding in and i was like why do you associate the two so our guy drew from Zone 32 podcast, he sent me a link, a link to a tweet that I think may have gotten some Ravens fans going on that kind of train of thought. And the link went to, I don't know if people have heard of it, maybe, well, obviously a lot of people did because people had seen this tweet. Uh, Jeff Moeller. Okay, he's a physical therapist and a fantasy football injury analyst. And the day that JK was placed on PUP, he tweeted a pretty obscure rule which I honestly didn't know. And I'm not going to read the the language of the rule he posted out because it's very lawyery and kind of confusing. So I'm going to read instead uh, Jeff Moeller's kind of like um, summary of what that rule means. So in that tweet, he says, it sounds like if J.K. Dobbins does not report, if he doesn't report to camp, the Ravens could keep him on PUP and the last year of his contract will toll, meaning he would enter 2024 on the last year of his contract again next season instead of being a free agent. And then Jeff writes, interesting move by the Ravens. So basically it's like if you're on your last year and you're on PUP the whole time, then then that doesn't advance your con. You don't accrue another season. So he wouldn't have his four years and then he'd be a free agent. So that's what he was saying. And so it sounded like, the internet kind of went crazy on it, but I've actually followed up with Jeff. We've tweeted a bit today. He didn't realize that JK had already reported and he has. So my still inclination, but we're going to find out soon. Harbaugh's talking with media on Wednesday. My inclination is that the Ravens are just being cautious with JK. That's what I think it's as simple as that. I could be wrong. I'm usually like, don't jump into the drama. I try to think of like the most simple way first because that's usually it. So I could be wrong, but that's what I think is happening. And like I said, to me, it's the wrong path for JK to hold out because it's not going to get him any money. And he's not even going to be, he would just be wishing to have the problems that Saquon and the rest of the guys are having right now. He first has to ball out and he can't do that without playing. So I don't think he's going to be holding out for the season at all. All right. On to some closing thoughts here before we finish up, we'll begin with Bengals owner, Mike Brown talking about essentially what the Ravens ownership and leadership and coaches had to talk about for what multiple years. And that mm -hmm. is, well, the equivalent for Cincy is Joe Burrow's contract related questions being that, well, he's, he's going to be due a lot of money at some point. And Mike Brown was, I wouldn't say peppered, but asked about not only Joe, but a lot of their playmakers not currently under long-term deals. Well, that's the issue, isn't it? Uh, think of the cap as a pie. And once you take out one piece, there's less left for the next guy. And it just is obvious that uh, when all teams are essentially paying the same thing, we're all paying up to the cap, no more, just that amount. It, it um, is hard to fit everybody in. It's impossible to fit everybody in at the rate they wish they could be paid. So you lose some guys every year. There's attrition. Uh, you try to work around it, and we have done that for a few years now. But it's uh, free agency in the draft, uh, re-signing guys, trying to fit all of that into the... Uh, uh, pie, a piece for everybody, but it's uh, just almost impossible to get everybody to think they got the piece they wanted. Would it be fair to say, Mike, that 
making sure Joe, Jamar, and T get a slice of pie is the priority on your end? Well, it's uh, pretty obvious uh, that uh, Joe is the heart of the matter. And uh, after that, uh, we want all the guys we can get, but uh, we may have to uh, go short in a couple cases. Before you drag him, Mike <laughs> Brown is 87 years and counting. So kudos to him for still meeting with the media. And uh, that's that. Cle- uh, Cleveland, Cincinnati is going to be dealing with with this as long as this is remaining to be outstanding, just as much, if not more, because of Joe's resume than, than Baltimore had to do over the last couple of years. I'm just interested, Bobby, if <clears throat> how the national media are going to treat this. Because with Baltimore and and Lamar, they try to make it be like just mortal enemies, right? And obviously when you're in negotiations, you're not necessarily on the same side, but they try to make it seem like one side was evil and one side was righteous, right? And it was just like non-stop. And so I'm just wondering, are they going to do that to the Bengals? Are they going to do that to the Bengals? And, and, you know, I'm not wishing for it, but I bet they are because that's what drives clicks is it's going to be like Burrow versus Mike Brown. And then on top of it, while he says Burrow's going I think the bigger news is that while Burrow is um, the heart of the matter, he basically is, I think he's basically saying, unless somebody wants to have a smaller pie, he's not getting all three Burrow, Chase and Higgins. So I already saw Ravens fans being like, all right, Jamar Chase, 20, 20, whatever, when he's a free agent or whatever. So um, it, it's going to be a lot of drama over there. And I just wish them the best. It buckle up because it is a brutal, brutal process for fans. I'll believe it when I see it in terms of uh, the national media treating bro or the organization like that, because Joe and Justin Herbert, remember, they're the golden boys, remember? <laughs> They're the national media's golden boys. And I'm not saying Joe hasn't deserved that kind of attention because he's been to a Super Bowl and he really has been electrifying the last couple seasons. But uh, maybe Justin, being that he, I don't be, even believe he has a playoff win under his belt yet, yet all of a sudden he's ahead of Lamar in all these rankings. Anyway, let's get to some quick hits before we close. Emma T Bank Stadium was nominated by USA Today as one of the best NFL stadiums. You can head over there to vote for the bank uh, to get that to the top. Mark Andrews, Ravens tight end, stopped by a summer camp on Monday morning for kids with type 1 diabetes. We know that Mark himself is a diabetic, and he has been very, very open about his journey throughout the process. It's honestly pretty inspiring, and he just continues to give back, continues to be the media good guy year in and year out. Can't wait to see what he has in store coming up in what year five what is it for mark year year six uh well he was got he his Lamar's year n- yeah he got yeah, yeah yeah he was drafted with lamar in 2018 third round year six for mark all of a sudden i don't know why i didn't remember that but we'll finish with this and it's a return to the vault for dan brown former ravens tight end who gave us that awesome classic all-time story between he and John Harbaugh back several years ago when he was with the team for a couple of years. Well, he's got another pretty good story here. And Sarah, we really got to track him down at some point because storytelling, I think, is like his bread and butter, Dan. And he talked a little bit about his former teammate, Joe Flacco, and did what nobody should ever do with a quarterback in the NFL who had just been signed. And that is compare checks. Joe Flacco, like real like interaction. So finally made like the active roster. <laughs> It was probably like in December, and we were all sitting at the lunch table, and they they pass out our checks in the locker room, paper checks. I got one, and uh, Joe got two, and he was sitting right next to me, and, and I remember just like sitting at the table, and I was just kind of like, I just kept eyeballing him. He was like, "You want to see him?" I'm like, "Hell yeah!" Like, so I open, he opens the first one, and gives it to me. It's like, after taxes, two hundred fifty thousand. This is for his sign and bonus. And I was like, he was like, yeah, that's part of my sign bonus. This is, yeah, per week. He gets 250 per week after taxes. And then the other one for his salary opened up 750 a week. He got one in a mill a week. And I was like, 
mine after taxes rookie year was twelve thousand five hundred dollars. It's like I'm I'm gonna walk into Wells Fargo and ask them just to deposit this. Like you can't walk into Wells Fargo with a million bucks and say, can you deposit this for me? Like every week, that's seventeen million dollars. You shouldn't be keeping like that. Like in just a Wells Fargo bank. So uh, I was like, what do you do with that? And he was like, well, my dad's. Uh, my dad handles my finances, so it just gets straightly, it's just straight, straight wired to him. And I was like, I, at that point, I was like, this is insane. Like a mill a week. I reconnected with Joe in, in New York, and he was just, it was, a, he's always been a good dude. Bobby, he's got a this great is, memory. He's got a great memory. He's a good storyteller. It's great for us as content creators. But remind me never to tell him anything personal because he is not afraid to just tell on people and like air out, air out whatever's going on. He's telling people stories. He's telling all that stuff so i'm not telling him anything as a friend but he is a great great as a content creator yeah, that's a good point you think harbs was thrilled with that story being released <laughs> in detail of him going back and forth and using explicit language and all that stuff i mean oh goodness gracious that's good stuff from dan brown hopefully we can get him on the show at some point we wanted to as always shout out two of our returning patrons who are supporting both of us our YouTube channel, our audio only endeavors uh, through Patreon this month. So Lauren Wonderlick, Ken Buckner, we appreciate you both for believing what we're building here in Baltimore and beyond. And if you're interested in doing the same, go ahead and check out what we're offering on Patreon by visiting patreon.com forward slash Ravens Vault podcast. All of that can be found, by the way, in the description of this video if you're watching on YouTube or also in the description of whatever platform audio wise that you might be tuning in from. So with that, that'll do it for this Tuesday morning vault edition. Thanks so much for being with us for my co-host, Sarah Ellison. I'm Bobby Trossett signing off and we will talk to you next on Wednesday. Wednesday.